So in this video, we'll give a brief overview of IXC agents, which are a specific type of reinforcement learning agent. This will be important when we later talk about Vanessa's research agenda. We're also going to talk about the simplicity prior, which will be valuable for a lot of the upcoming videos. We'll end by briefly talking about decision theory and why decision theory is used as important research for alignment. Okay, so in the last two videos, we introduced Bayes' rule, which is a powerful updating rule, allowing you to use evidence to update your beliefs in an ideal way. What this swept under the rug was how difficult it is to pick a prior distribution. What should be my prior set of beliefs before I observe any evidence? In some contexts, there's an obvious prior to pick, like the example Jack gave in the Bayesianism video involving coins. There was an obvious choice of prior. But in reinforcement learning, the agent starts with no understanding of the environment, so there is no obvious prior to pick. In cases like this, is there a reasonable prior we can use, one that isn't just uniform or runs the risk of being misspecified? The answer is yes. Occam's razor is going to come to our rescue. To motivate Occam's razor, let's go through an example. Suppose you and a friend observe some computer program outputting a sequence, and it outputs 1, 3, 5, and 7. You both don't have much on that day, so you decide to guess what the next number will be. Neither of you have any idea on what determines the computer program. Your friend starts furiously scribbling away on a piece of paper, and after a few minutes of writing lots of different maths equations, he says, I've figured it out. It's outputting the numbers in a sequence 2n to the power of 4 minus 20n cubed plus 70n squared minus 98n plus 47. And so by my calculation, the next number must be 33. You're dubious of this and confused why he thinks this is a good hypothesis. You calmly say to your friend, doesn't 9 seem like an obvious choice? 1, 3, 5, and 7 are the first four odd numbers, so why wouldn't the answer be the fifth odd number? Your friend understands what you're saying, but he points out both your hypothesis and his fit the data. They both predict 1, 3, 5, and 7. They only disagree on data you haven't observed yet, so your hypothesis can't be more likely than his, right? Okay, you have this intuition that he's wrong here, and 9 is the obvious choice. Fortunately for you, Occam's razor captures this intuition. There is a philosophical principle that agrees. Occam's razor says, among all hypotheses consistent with the observations, simpler ones will be more likely. So let's try to explain to your friend why his hypothesis isn't a great choice. Let's assume the computer program is only outputting terms of a polynomial, so we only have to, we only have to consider polynomial hypotheses, just to make our life a bit easier. You point out there are infinitely many polynomials that fit the data. You point out that his quartic isn't even special. Any quartic of the form I've written here gives 1, 3, 5, and 7 as the first four terms. But by changing the A number, you can make the fifth term anything you want. All of these will fit the data. There is only one linear hypothesis that fits the data, and that's 2n minus 1. What's more, there is only one linear hypothesis after just two data points, 1 and 3. There are no other linear hypotheses left that fit the data after this. The fact that this linear hypothesis then fits the next two data points as well seems significant. To some extent, your hypothesis is making less assumptions. There are less free variables in yours, and yet somehow it still manages to fit the data, despite being so simple. This principle is called Occam's razor. It's a general heuristic in science that you should default towards simple hypotheses when you have a bunch to fit the data. You might be skeptical of this outside of the example I've just given. To that, I would say it's a principle that is espoused in philosophy quite generally, and also is also used in modern science as one of its backbones. It also has a lot of empirical evidence. For example, Einstein had it in mind when developing special relativity, and the inventors of quantum mechanics also had it in mind when developing that theory. One of the insights here is that scientists like hypotheses that are more falsifiable, and simpler hypotheses are generally more falsifiable than complex ones. If we consider our examples of the linear hypothesis 2n minus 1, that had only two parameters. It was falsifiable after just two data points, right? All linear hypotheses were falsifiable after just two data points. With the quartics, we would need three extra data points to falsify quartics as a possibility. So these hypotheses were less falsifiable than the hypothesis that you had. Okay, so that was Occam's razor. And if you're going to take anything from this video, I think using Occam's razor to help you sift through hypotheses as a heuristic is extremely valuable. Everything from this point onwards will be a bit more conceptual and based on specifically the IXC agent. <clears throat> In the last case, we had hypotheses specified by polynomials, and there was a really obvious choice of complexity. It was just the degree of the polynomial. How many terms were there in it? When talking about IXE, we want to use programs and talk about the complexity of different programs. In this case, the choice of complexity is a little less clear. What we do is we use Kolmogorov complexity as our complexity measurement. This is quite a complicated concept, and so I'll give some intuition here for what it is. 
<clears throat> but basically, knowing there is a complexity measurement you can use for programs that is reasonable will be enough for us to proceed after this slide. So Kolmogorov complexity is the shortest description length of a program. As an example, if we consider two different strings of text, one is the letters AB repeated 16 times, and the other is 24 characters I produced by mashing my keyboard, so they should be random. We can think of programs that would output these two strings. In the English language, the first string can be written as write AB 16 times, and this has 17 characters. The second string must be written as write and then all the symbols in the string, and that has 30 characters. So that has a longer description length, and so has a higher Kolmogorov complexity. Now that was done in the English language. IXE is going to use what's called a universal description language to express the relevant programs. So issues to do with using the English language and shortenings and things like that are going to be a problem. There is some universal description language IXE can use, and we can, and we can use Kolmogorov complexity in that context to define complexity in a reasonable way. Okay, so with Kolmogorov complexity and Occam's razor out of the way, we can talk about IXE agents. IXE is an agent that exists in the reinforcement learning setting and usually the finite re reinforcement learning setting. Like most reinforcement learning agents, it tries to maximize its cumulative reward. IXE, unlike in Markov decision processes, does not assume fully observable or Markov of the environment. So IXE works with the full history when making decisions, every observation, reward, and action that it's seen or taken. IXE does make one assumption about the environment, which is that it's computable. What this means is it can be represented by some program. So there is some program Q, which, given the set of actions the IXE agent has taken, it can tell you exactly what it would have observed in the evolution of the environment. Okay, so how does IXE go about making decisions? IXE is very similar to a Bayesian agent, so it's going to need a prior over all computable environments, since that's the only assumption we have, that the environment belongs to the class of computable environments. And IXE is going to use Occam's razor to weigh the different programs in the prior. So which ones are more likely or not, with no other information, Let's weigh them by their Kolmogorov complexity. The more complex they are, the less likely they will seem to be. So given some environment E, which you should think of as a program, with some Kolmogorov complexity, K of E, we allocate a prior probability of two to the power of minus K of E. So the bigger K is, the smaller this number will be. The reason we use an exponentially weighted K here is so that the sum of all the prior distribution components will sum to some finite number. So we can normalize and use a genuine probability distribution. This allocates non-zero probability to every hypothesis, so there is a grain of truth in this prior. So the agent should be able to figure out what environment it's actually in. If this seems complicated, the main point you should take away is that there is a prior distribution that doesn't assume anything about the environment specifically, but captures the intuition that simpler is more likely. So that's how it sets up its prior. How does it update when it gets no evidence? Well, IXC updates very similar to a Bayesian agent. It doesn't do quite the same thing, it removes all hypotheses that are no longer consistent with the data, but it doesn't weigh them based on the likelihood of prediction. That's how IXE updates the prior, but what about making decisions? There, are, there is a very scary formula for how IXE makes decisions, but it has a nice intuitive explanation. Basically, IXE considers each action it could take and calculates the expected cumulative reward from that point onwards for each action in each environment within the prior. It then weighs this expected reward by the likelihood of that environment and sums. Whichever action gives the best expected reward when you weigh the environment appropriately is the action it takes. Basically, it takes the action that makes the most sense given the prior, accounting for all the environments the prior says could be possible. This allows it to account for its uncertainty about which environment it's in, hedging its bets by thinking about all of them. This makes IXE the Bayes optimal agent according to its prior. To put this simply, IXE combines Occam's razor with Bayesian reasoning to navigate an environment. So why are we interested in IXE at all? IXE is incomputable, so it can't exist in the real world. There is a modification called IXE TL, but this is infeasible, so it doesn't really solve the problem. Despite these things, IXE is a powerful toy model for reasoning about artificial general intelligence. An IXE agent could be applied to any problem, really. And so if an IXE agent has some problem with it, that could be a concern for humans. And it seems likely this could pop up in the super intelligent machines we might have in the future. So it gives us a way to reason about super intelligent systems, without actually having access to any. And IC does have a lot of problems beyond just being incomputable. I hinted this earlier when we talked about Bayesian reinforcement learning. There are still lots of problems in IC even beyond being incomputable. Infra Bayesianism is motivated by these problems. I'm sorry for the cliffhanger here, and Jack is going to go into detail on this when we talk about Vanessa's agenda, uh, specifically what these problems are and how IB will solve them. Uh, but that's why IC will be important for this video series. 
Before we finish this video, I'll talk briefly about decision theory, which relates to a lot of different agent foundations work, particularly that done at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Decision theory is concerned with principles or algorithms that aim to make correct decisions within some environment. And these decisions can be made in the presence of other agents or with other aspects of the environment being unknown in some way. It's a very general framework for approaching decisions. There are several different branches of decision theory, and each one has a different method of approaching problems, and they are concerned with different things. For example, some might be concerned about how different agents make decisions, for example, how humans make decisions, and others might be concerned with selecting between different processes to make optimal decisions. As some examples of decision theory that people in alignment are interested in, we have functional decision theory, where agents treat their decisions as the output of some fixed function. We have causal decision theory, where agents take actions that maximize the causal consequences of outcomes they see as desirable. And evidential decision theory, which is a decision theory that advises agents to take actions which, conditional on them happening, maximizes the chances of desired outcomes. All three of these have different flaws, and, the envir and environments can be constructed that cause them to perform badly. Jack will talk about this a bit when we discuss new code environments in the information video. You might think this sounds a lot like reinforcement learning. Uh, the main difference is that in reinforcement learning, we don't know how the environment works and must figure this out as we go. Decision theory includes problems like this, uh, but also other problems. For example, cases where we might know how the environment works and we have to plan using this information to perform well. To get a flavor for different decision theories, we'll talk about an example where evidential decision theory recommends a different behavior to functional and causal decision theory. This example is called the smoking lesion. In our world, smoking is strongly correlated with lung cancer. Imagine a world where this correlation is actually understood to be the result of a common cause, a genetic lesion that tends to cause both smoking and cancer. So in this world, smoking doesn't actually do any harm. It's just correlated to harm because of some underlying factor. For people who have this genetic lesion, they're more likely to get cancer whether they smoke or not. And for people without this genetic lesion, smoking also doesn't affect their cancer rate. Now suppose an agent called Alfred enjoys smoking, but won't do it if it causes cancer. What should Alfred do? Causal decision theory focuses on causal effects. And so if Alfred uses causal decision theory to make decisions, he will decide to smoke, since there is no causal link between smoking and cancer. If Alfred uses functional decision theory, he will come to the same conclusion, since the decision-making procedure, which he thinks of as a function, doesn't affect whether or not he gets cancer. If Alfred uses evidential decision theory, though, he will be worried that smoking is evidence that he has the genetic lesion, which could lead to him getting cancer. Due to this, Alfred won't smoke, if this, is the, if this is the decision making procedure he's using. We see different decision making procedures have different outcomes. So why is decision theory interesting when thinking about alignment? Here are a few reasons people are interested in decision theory, courtesy of an article written by Weidai on Less Wrong. Decision theory gives us information about what it means to be rational and how different agents could go about pursuing their goals. As part of this, it gives us a terminology that we can use to talk about agents and agentic behavior. Decision theory gives us a better understanding of failure modes. If there is some flaw in certain decision-making procedures, then we should keep an eye out for these in our AI systems, since this may be part of the decision theory that they use. Decision theory can help us clear up intellectual questions that we don't really understand. Things like free will, reasoning about uncertainty, uh, how, how different agents will cooperate, reasoning about counterfactuals, which means reasoning about worlds where you did something different. All of these can be explored using decision theory. It also lets us explore human rationality. What sorts of mistakes do humans make and what are their nature? Are they predictable mistakes or are they more random? Wei Dai is also quick to point out that decision theory is unlikely to provide a specification for training a super intelligent AI system. It's more the hope that decision theory will contribute the same way understanding Newtonian physics helps us build a rocket to get to the moon. It doesn't tell you how to build a rocket, but it's useful in achieving this very difficult goal. Okay, so why is decision theory relevant for these videos? Decision theory is a vital part of lots of agent foundations work, as I mentioned, and Jack will be talking about this in the next video. But also, decision theory often assumes the environment is given, but in the real world, we will need to learn about the environment as we go, which we will see infobagianism is capable of since it is an update to reinforcement learning. Of particular importance is the fact that problems that people use to test decision theories, like Newcomb environments, provide tests for infobationism as well. And so decision theory provides a good testing ground for the usefulness of infobationism. If you want to learn more about the topics that I've talked about here, there are lots of good resources. Thomas Larson's intuitive explanation of IXE is helpful for understanding in more detail 
how IC makes decisions and explains the IC decision-making formula in a very easy to understand way with lots of different examples. Jan Leiker also has a thorough explanation of IC, which starts by initially introducing reinforcement learning. Alex Altair's explanation of Solomonov induction is great for understanding more about IC and also is also very easy to understand and is an enjoyable read. There are also lots of good resources for learning about decision theory. Luke Prog's decision theory FAQs post goes through decision theory in detail and is a good first resource to consider. Abraham Densky and Scott Garabrandt's resource is also good for considering how decision theory and embedded agency relate. Links to all of these will be included in the video description. All right, I will see you in a future video.